can can any of you tell me, you know, or maybe not even just tell me, but how many of you by a show of hands can say, you know, I, I know pretty much most there is to know about, you know, Noah, the flood, and everything that kind of went down with that. You, you kind of, you or at least you got the gist of the story now, you know. Big boat, there was nobody that was righteous. God found Noah and his family, said build a boat, put two of every kind of animal on it. Um, it's going to rain eventually, and then one day it rains, and everybody dies, and they float for a while, and then eventually it dries up, and everybody gets out, and hey, you know, repopulates. That's pretty much the Sunday school answer. That's pretty much the little books you hear. Um, we're going to add a small component to that that may have been glossed over or just neglected. Uh, we're looking at a Satan study for the purpose of learning about who he is as a creature, how he operates, uh, because again, the more we learn about how he operates over the course of his history, the more we can understand and recognize how he operates, or we can at least recognize when we may be in the midst of a demonic or spiritual warfare in our own lives. Um, and again, um, sometimes uh, one of my favorite um, Bible professors says that, I think it was Dr. Greg Harris, says that sometimes we just need to read the Bible and study the Bible, not to learn what we need to do. No application whatsoever. Some people are like, why would you read it if there's no application? Listen here. Sometimes we need to study the Bible just to learn more about God. That's it. Just to get to know Him. Sometimes we need to read the Bible, in the sense of the state study, just to get to know our enemy. The more we get to know our enemy, the more we will recognize our enemy. You should get to know people that you care about and you love, and you should also at least study and get to know people that are out to get you. That way you can pick up on things and you're not blindsided. So we're going to look at this. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 6. That's where we're going to start. Uh, we'll drop back into chapter 5 just a little bit. Um, we'll flip over to the New Testament just a little bit. Um, I'll give you the Bible verses. Uh, you don't have to write them all down if you don't want to, because, again, there will be notes that will be posted at some point. But Genesis chapter 6... Um, starting in verse 8, starts the story, or starts it actually in verse 5, starts the story of the flood. But we, we got to kind of back up a little bit here and kind of recap. You know, we looked at a biography of Satan. Last week we looked at Adam and Eve in the garden and Satan in the fall. Then we looked at chapter 4 a little bit with Cain and Abel. You know, Satan wanted to get Adam and Eve to fall um, because, you know, the way you get back at the one who cursed you, God, is to go after his children, i.e. the creatures created in his image. He goes after them thinking they're going to be eternally damned just like him. Uh, God says, no, actually, not actually a child, a male child, a seed, uh, that masculine um, Hebrew word there, is going to crush your head, Satan. They're going to have an opportunity for redemption. You're not, you're still going to burn. So Satan ends in that, in that situation going, okay, I'm still going, the moment that a male child of the woman comes about, that's the moment that my head's going to be crushed. So he's going to try to delay, delay, delay. If he can delay male children from coming, hey, you know, Maybe, maybe, maybe just maybe. So see Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel, you know, um, Scripture in John and all throughout the New Testament, it refers to Satan being a murderer from the beginning. Um, Cain killed Abel because Cain was of the evil one. You know, Satan was behind that first murder between the first two male children born that we know of. Um, so, you know, why would Satan instigate a murder? Well, if a male child is going to crush his head and usher in his destruction, Cain and Abel, male children. Cain kills Abel. One's dead, can't be the savior. One is disqualified from being the savior because he's a murderer. Hey, you delayed. You won. Not the end of the story. It says in chapter 4 that Adam and Eve had another son. His name was um, Seth. I think it was Seth, um, if I remember correctly here. Yep. Um, and then <laughs> we see a nice genealogy in chapter 5. Don't you just love genealogies when you're studying the scriptures? So and so begat so and so who begat so and so and lived so so and so many years, and then like seven chapters later, you're asleep and you're like, why is this in here? It's not holy, nor is it inspired, and it's boring. You're about to find out why it's extremely important. From the day that Cain, or from the day that Adam and Eve had Seth, their third child, Adam was 130 years old. Exactly 997 years later, the flood would come about. So roughly a thousand years later, the flood would come about. Just to kind of give you a little idea here, most people think, oh, you know, between Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah, and the flood, you know, oh, that's just, you know, back to back to back. There's um, somewhere around 600 years between uh, Seth being born um, from Adam and Eve to the flood. 600 years. A lot of people can be born in a course of 600 years, especially when people were living seven, 800 years old at that point. I mean, if you're having kids from 
you know, 20, 30, all the way up to maybe a few hundred years old. I mean, it's kind of like rabbits. I mean, exponentially. You know, all the, the earth is being multiplied everywhere. Um, that's why when we get into the flood in chapter 6, you'll see that God said he saw no man across the face of the earth that was holy. Um, one of the things that you're going to see here is that this genealogy in chapter 5 is important, but we'll get to that. Let's start in chapter 6, verse 1. Remember, we're looking at Satan here, and you're going to see something pretty awesome. Chapter 6, verse 1 of Genesis. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. Um, some translations say that, that that is good. That's the same word when it said when Eve saw that um, the fruit was good. It was appealing to her eyes. It was attractive. So the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim, does anyone in their translation have giants there? The word giants, chapter, uh, verse 4, the giants. One, okay. Let's look at that one. The Nephilim, or the giants, were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It's overemphasis. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, and from man to animals to creeping things and to the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. We're not going to get into the actual flood here, but we're going to, we're going to look at these first nine verses here. A few little keys here, okay? Um, you have a post-Adam and Eve setting here. Uh, probably about 600 years. Middle East is probably swarming with people at this point. Again, they're spreading out. Animals have been multiplying like crazy as well. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a pretty, um, pretty fruitful earth at this point. But the scripture says that when, when man started having daughters, okay, and, you know, when Adam and Eve started having girls, and then, you know, the kids started multiplying, and there was more guys and more girls, more guys and more girls, that it says that these creatures... Um, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. Now, you've got to look at the, the context here. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men. It automatically makes you think these sons of God are, are not men because they would have said that the men saw that the daughters of other men were beautiful and took wives. Okay, this phrase here, sons of God, or yeah, sons of God, is only used one other time, actually two times, in the entire Old Testament. Once it's used here, and then again in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. We'll actually look at Job chapter 1 and chapter 2 for the purpose of this study. But that phrase in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2 is referring to angels. Sons of God has only appeared two times in the scripture. Genesis chapter 6 and Job chapter 1 and 2. It only refers to angelic beings, period. No other time. So angels saw that human women were beautiful. And they took them to be married to them, and they had children with them, whomever they wanted, which shows that human men had no say-so in the matter. And that um, culture, especially throughout the Middle East, and even, I mean, all the way back to their arranged marriages, are pretty much have been the norm in human societies up until the past maybe 50, 75 years, believe it or not. Um, so it kind of alludes to the fact that they didn't have a say in the matter. Angels married human women and had children to them. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It might, might be a little sci-fi-ish here, but it's biblical, which means it happened. It's real life. But it gets, it, it gets better. Okay? It, it gets better. God said that my spirit 
will not strive with man forever. Nevertheless, his days will be 120 years. At the time of the flood, Noah was 600 years old. So at this point right here, there's going to be 120 years from the moment that God makes this pronouncement that he's not going to, he's not going to you know, strive with man forever. There's going to be a 120-year period from this moment in chapter 6 to the time that the flood comes. This will be the moment that he's, you know, at the same time period that he sees Noah, that he recognizes Noah as a blameless man, and then calls him, you know, to build the ark and all these things. But <laughs> you got to see something here. He's about to destroy the earth. We know that because if we can read through the chapter. But he's going to wait 120 years. He, he says in this passage that he sees man, every single man except for Noah. Every single man except for Noah. His heart is only evil continually. He even says that the Lord was sorry that he made man. He was grieved in his heart. Now this is a personification of God here. Uh, You've got to understand that God communicates to us in such a way that we can understand both emotionally and um, you know, in just our understanding. It wasn't that God was sorry that he made man as if though he made a mistake. It's just he's commuting such a, he's communicating such a deep grief that my creation is, is everywhere. And they're nothing but filthy, evil. Their hearts are set on evil. That's all it's set on. I'm about to destroy every one of them. Man, woman, child, birds, creatures, Everything. Now he's gonna, and we know the end of the story, he's gonna preserve two of each kind so that the earth can be repopulated in the end. But he's gonna get rid of all that and basically start over in a sense. But you gotta see this. God's being gracious um, for 120 years. We see in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter and uh, John actually refer to Noah in, in, this, in this situation quite a bit. In uh, 1 Peter chapter or First yeah, Peter chapter three verse twenty or nineteen and twenty, um, it says uh, that Jesus went and made proclamation to the spirits that are now in prison, the spirits who were disobedient, um, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few would be saved. You know, God was patiently wait. Why was He patiently waiting? You know, some people say, "Oh, He was patiently waiting, waiting for people to repent." Great possibility. He was patiently waiting because he knew it was going to take Noah a long time to build the ark. Good idea. Um, <laughs> you you got to think about it. God wasn't just, oh, I'm tired of my creation. I'm going to kill them all. He's patiently waiting. And we got to ask ourselves sometimes in our own application here, when we're, our hearts are set on evil continually, how patient will God be with us? 120 years? 120 days? 120 minutes? Not at all. <laughs> Either way, it shows that God is gracious and merciful here and not just you know, a, a hateful God as some people would like to paint him because of what happens here. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, um, it's, or verse 4 and 5, it says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the pits of darkness, reserved for judgment, and didn't spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, preacher of righteousness, along with seven others, um, he goes on. To, Peter goes on to tell here basically that God, God will destroy false teachers, but He will preserve as well. He will deal justly, but He will preserve. Now, God's going to wait 120 years here. Um, we we see that constantly. But my mind keeps going back to these children, these hybrid children, half angelic being and half human. The Hebrew word there is nephilim. So in some translations where it says the nephilim were in the land in those days. It's because they literally took, the Hebrew word is nephilim. That's, that's what it is. Some translations translate it giants because some scholars argue that these were giants like Goliath. Um, he would have been a descendant of the nephilim potentially, the sons of Anak, some of these things. However, there are a lot of scholars, a lot of scholars, especially a lot of the, uh, the rabbis, especially at the time of Christ, predating the, we know, they don't, they don't buy that, that oh, it was just giants. They go under the mentality that these were hybrid children. These were offspring of angels and humans. The word Nephilim um, is a plural word. The em on it makes the Hebrew word plural. The, the root word of it is nephal, which means to fall. Okay? So literally, fall plural, this word literally translates the fallen ones. The fallen ones. Once. Um, they're described as mighty men of old, men of renown, and imp- literally empowered things, empowered men, 
and power. I mean, like, I mean, powerful. I mean, if you mix an angel who is grossly, grossly more um, intelligent and powerful in their abilities than mankind, mixed with a man, I mean, it's almost like you get a demigod, so to speak. I mean, if we're going to use Greek mythology terms here. So, I mean, these are, these are pretty big deal. Now, something that's not you're not going to see in the notes if you actually download them later is, is if you read through Numbers, the book of Numbers, when Moses and the people are in the wilderness and he sends out the spies into the Canaan and they come back and the ten of them are freaked out. Two of them are like, no, we can do this with God's help. The ten come back all freaked out because they say the Nephilim are in the promised land. If you read very closely, it is at that moment that God gets very ticked off with the people and says, you're going to die in the wilderness. Why? If there were really giants, I mean, Goliath was a giant. He was in the promised land. I mean, why are God you going to get ticked off at them if, I mean, if they're really there, if there really are giants? Why are you going to get ticked off, God, if they said the Nephilim are in the land, they're you know, giant, all this stuff, whatever? Why? That's not fair, God. Unless that's not what really was going on. You know, if, if, check this out. If the people in Moses' day said, we saw Nephilim, fallen hybrid children, that had survived the flood some, you know, seven, eight hundred years earlier. Still in the promised land, God did not wipe out evil like he said he was going to do. God actually didn't kill off everything. God wasn't, um, he, didn't, he didn't do what he said he was going to do. And we're about to walk into, we've heard the stories. We know what that was like in the days of Noah. We've heard, we've heard. And God didn't know. They're still there. You call God a liar to his face and call him saying he ain't done what he was supposed to do. I can imagine why he'd say you're going to die in the wilderness. <laughs> you're not going to find him. You're not going to make it there. So the, these creatures are, um, <laughs> there's they're something different. Now, one of the arguments that you'll hear from people and scholars that say, no, this couldn't happen, is because when the rabbis and the, and the, and the Pharisees asked Jesus one time, they say, well, you know, is there going to be marriage in heaven? And Jesus says, no. There will be no giving or taking of marriage in heaven because we will be like the angels who are in heaven. You know, the angels don't give and take in marriage. They're ones in heaven. Therefore, we won't either. And people go, well, if, they, if the angels can't give or take in marriage, which the byproduct of marriage is offspring, you know, then, then this really couldn't have been what it is. These Nephilim couldn't have been hybrid um, creatures or whatnot. Again, God doesn't just waste words in scriptures because check this out. There are angels that are not in heaven. The angels who are in heaven are obedient, sinless creatures that have not given or taken in marriage because that's what they were supposed to not do. There are angels that got kicked out of heaven. Just, just throwing that out there. <laughs> um, and if we let the scripture interpret itself, that is not a very hard argument to make. <clears throat> so, the women bore children to fallen angels. Demons, now more specifically, sinful and demons took women, had children with them for 120 years. Because again, God, it says right there that you know the Lord said my spirit won't strive forever. I'm going to give them 120 years. And the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and afterwards. For this 120 year period, the Nephilim and the demons who were having these Nephilim would, I mean, think about it. You get weeds in your yard and you don't cut it and dig them up. They're going to spread and you wait a few more months. They're going to spread. Wait a few more months. Eventually, you're going to have a yard full of weeds. I mean, it's the same way with, with um, sports teams or anything else. If you've got one bad apple in the group, if you don't deal with them, eventually you're going to have a bunch of bad apples. I mean, bad, bad uh, company corrupts good morals. I mean, that's what the Scripture says. So you can imagine these hybrid children who are mighty men of renown, empowered beings. You ain't really going to stop a whole lot of them. You know what I'm saying? If they want to do what they want to I mean, like I said, they took whomever they wanted. Why is the interesting question here? Why is the interesting question? You know, they stepped outside of their proper role. They were disobedient. Let's keep looking at this. Verse 5, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the hearts was only on evil continually. You know, God, a lot of Jewish theologians talk about how this was, you know, that every intent of the heart was the reason for God's judgment. Um, you know, these people, they chose to commit evil in light of knowing good and evil. They knew, and God um, and His righteousness are going to, He's going to deal with them according to their own sin. They have to be held accountable. They have to be responsible. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> and we also need to look at our own hearts at times, because the enemy can definitely grab a 
hold of our hearts and manipulate us, um, so to speak, when our hearts are set on evil. Oh, well, my heart's not set on evil. If your heart is set on doing or being a part of something, a thought, an emotion, an action that is not of God, your heart is set on evil. I mean, I, there's no way to sugarcoat that one at all. God's grief, we've already kind of covered a little bit of that of what it talks about, how God communicates this to a way that we understand. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it communicates to us how the Holy Spirit is grieved when we sin. So when you sin, you hurt God's heart. You grieve the Holy Spirit, I mean, not upset, grieve, emotionally tear the heart out of God, so to speak, uh, when you do these things. But it still, it still doesn't explain these hybrid children to me. I mean, like, it's, I mean, it's like, you read the story and you're like, okay, you know, there's men, there's things going on, there's, you know, God's going to destroy the earth. Oh, but there was these hybrid children born. Oh, let's keep going on with the story. It's like, there's this piece that's just thrown in here that's like, okay, the story's flowing, Adam and Eve, the fall, Cain and Abel, you know, this stuff, the genealogies, okay, hybrid children, demon, demons having children with women and married and all that stuff for over 100 years. Oh, and then he calls Noah in the flood. It still doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Why would demons, again, Satan was their ringleader. If you read through the New Testament, when Satan was cast from heaven, he took a third of the angels with him. So middle, militaristic terms here. He was the commanding officer, the prince of the powers of the air, as Ephesians would say. Uh, he, he's the ruler of the demon. So why would he instigate and or allow his demons to do this? There's got to be a motive. As a general commander, you don't let the guys under you do things that may jeopardize your overall plan. You let them do and command them to do what is going to potentially fulfill your plan. So let's jump back to Genesis chapter 5 a little bit here, okay? Remember, Adam and Eve were told that a seed was going to come, a male child was going to come, and he was going to deliver them from the curse of the land. He's going to crush sin. Say, basically, Garden of Eden is going to be restored when this guy comes, which means people are going to be looking for him. Now, remember, Noah and the flood takes place a long time after Adam and Eve. Uh, Methuselah. Anybody know anything about Methuselah? He is the oldest man that ever lived, old as dirt, like 969 years, if my math, um, is, if I'm recalling it correctly. Um, check this out, though, okay? Methuselah, I think we're starting chapter 5, verse 21. Um, sorry, yeah, 21. And Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Methuselah would have a son named Lamech. Lamech would have a son named Noah. So Methuselah is Noah's grandfather. Methuselah's name in Hebrew means man of the dark, which most scholars believe translates, that phrase translates as, his death shall bring judgment. That's a great name to have. When you, my name means my death will bring judgment. When I die, judgment's going to come. Look at the grace of God here. When I die, judgment will come. But I'm going to live longer than anybody else. Wow, the patience and grace of God here. <laughs> he lived 187 years before he had a son, Lamech. Um, and he lived 782 years after that. Uh, Lamech, his name in Hebrew means powerful man. He lived 182 years and then had a son named Noah and lived 595 years after Noah's birth. Um, Lamech named his son Noah, which in Hebrew means rest. It means rest. But I want you to see something here. Okay. Verse 29 of chapter 5. Now he, Lamech, called his name Noah, his son Noah, saying, quote, This one shall give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. Why would Noah be thinking that this is the one, this is the male child that's going to give us rest from the curse of creation if they were still not expecting nearly five, six, seven hundred years later that a male child would be born that would give them rest from the toils of their labors that was cursed because of Adam's sin and would give them rest. I mean, Jesus said, come to me all you who are weary and heavy, heavy laden, I will give you rest for your souls. I mean, heaven is going to be eternal rest. Lamech here is thinking, maybe, maybe this is the one, the Savior, that male seed that's coming. Which means, I mean, if he was that excited about it, that means there must have been a lot of people that were still expecting 
this Messiah. Now, this is also important because most people think, and again, maybe none of you are in this situation, but a lot of people think that salvation in the Old Testament was due to the sacrifices and the killing of lambs and goats and this, that, and the other. New Testament, we believe in Jesus. Old Testament, you had to do sacrifices. Wrong. Sacrifices had absolutely nothing to do with salvation in the Old Testament. They had to do with daily fellowship. Like now, through the blood of Jesus, when we sin, we have to confess our sins with God or else our relationship with Jesus is going to be like this. We're still his children, but there's going to be tension in the relationship. In the Old Testament, they were saved by, the, by faith in a coming Messiah. We're saved now in, in faith that a Messiah came. So it's kind of like they were Adam and Eve. If they got saved. They would have been saved by believing the promise that a Messiah was coming. We believe in the promise that a Messiah came and is coming again. Okay, So they're thinking, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Everybody would have been thinking, maybe. I mean, it's been a hundred, several hundreds of years, but we still think he's coming. Maybe this is the one. His name is Rest. He lives 500 years, has three sons himself, Noah does. When he was 600 years old, the flood came. It was the 600th year, second month of the year, 17th day. I there's a long way to figure that out, and I figured it out once, and I forgot it, and I didn't put it in my notes, so just trust me on that one. <laughs> um, and he lived 350 years after the flood, but check this out. If you do the math, Methuselah, my death will bring about judgment. The year of the flood was Methuselah's death. Just saying. <laughs> um, and I actually think, according to... Uh, um, what is it? I think it's, uh, yeah. I think it was actually, according to Genesis 7, uh, 4 and 10, I want to say that Methuselah died seven days before the flood. Um, a lot of scholars and rabbis teach that. So when he died, it started raining. Interesting. So we got hundreds of years here, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, a thousand years from Adam to Noah, where people are looking for this seed. I bet you there's somebody else looking for this seat too. You know what I mean? And I bet you, as the world starts getting very overpopulated, so to speak, with lots of men, that it's starting to become harder to figure out which man is going to be the seat. So if you can't keep up with all of them, and if you can't beat them, join them. If you can't get, um, if you can't stop people from drinking all the clean water because you can't take all the cups of water out of their hand, you go pour blood in the pitcher of water over there. Because even just with you got one drop of blood in the water, no one's going to want to drink that. Defile the seed. Start telling your demons, which could be millions that followed you out of heaven, it's a sin. Start having kids with them, marry them, take on them have children because eventually we'll kill off the human race because the demon the empowered men may kill the other ones and evil will prevail and guess what there won't be a seed left that's pure Cain and Abel yeah we messed that one up Cain killed Abel they had another male child we'll get them all we'll defile every single one of them they can't defeat us now God says I'm going to wait 120 years and then I'm going to destroy every single one of them, except for this blameless man that I found whose name is Noah. I'm going to start over. They had a choice. They could have fought back. They could have walked with the Lord. I mean, again. But he's going to destroy it. Satan's going to defile it. Again, why would he do this? Because he just thinks he can win? No. He doesn't. He doesn't. He never thought he could win against God. But he danger thinks he can delay, delay, delay. If he can defile the seed, he buys himself another day before that eternal judgment is going to take place. Yeah. So the whole point here is, is that the seed had to come. God, I mean, think about this. If God doesn't send the flood and kill off the human race and everything, Jesus may not come. Jesus came through the line of Noah. An undefiled seed, so to speak. God had for us to be here and to be saved, God had to do this. He had to clean up. He had to be gracious and wait, but he had to clean up to keep his promise. Or else God is a liar, according to Genesis chapter 3, where he said a seed will come. Satan thought we could do this, but God said, well, I'm going to clean up this mess. 
You see God's graciousness and His mercy, but also His loving faithfulness, His, his hesed love, that loving kindness in the Hebrew Scripture. You see His, his long-term plan for redemption for me and you and for all of mankind. Because again, if the Savior doesn't come, Methuselah who died, Adam who died, Enoch who was taken up, all these people, they can't be saved. If the seed never comes, everyone that was saved by believing that He was coming, oh, sorry, they're, they're, they're lost now because God ended up lying and couldn't fulfill His promise. God had to do this. He defeated the enemy one more time in Scripture so that me and you could experience victory in the defeat of death and sin. That's, a, <laughs> that's an awesome thing. here. Now, I'm going to get into a little bit of application here. Um, and then yeah, I'm going to kind of jump back into the answer a few little questions probably that maybe spin in your mind here or maybe just give you a little bit more information um, before we kind of end up. But application here that we got to think from the way the enemy works and the way that God works, um, especially when spiritual warfare goes on, is that God patiently waits for us to return to him, but not forever. And you think, oh, I've, I've just done too much. God's done with me. I've, I've been backslidden or I've been wrapped up in my sin and my filthiness or whatever. I've been pushing God away for so long. He's just he waited 120 years. Last time I checked, most of us are probably not going to live that long. You know what I'm saying? He waited it. Oh, but, but you know, would God wait that long? He did it once before. He never changes. That's what he says. He says he doesn't change. Therefore, he will wait patiently on you, but not forever. That doesn't mean you got all the time in the world to have your fun before you give your life over to the Lord Jesus. But it does mean if you're wondering, is he, can he still use me? Yeah, return. He patiently and lovingly wants to fulfill his purpose in your life and mine. God knew the sins of man and had a plan from day one to preserve the seed. Think this out. God was not caught off guard with Satan's neat little plan here to defile with the demons and the children and all that stuff. God had a plan. He, uh, Proverbs chapter 3 verse 20 talks about he foreknew and he had the plan of the flood of the rain coming down to destroy the earth. He knew. He knew that it was going to happen. And he still let it happen. And he still accomplished his plan of protecting. Which means... When you get wrapped up in sin and the enemy does get a foothold in your life at times and you think, oh, it's over, I'm defiled, I can't be used. God knew that that was going to happen. He wants to teach you and grow you out of that so you won't make the same mistake again. You have a testimony of his victory in your life of pulling you out and he's still going to keep using you going forward. You have, the enemy wants you to think, nope, you're defiled, you can't be used. Oh, you've been wrapped up too long, you're, you're, you're done. God says, I am patiently victorious. I wait and I wait and I wait and I still win. Period. No matter how bad it gets, I still win. And another application here that we got to understand is Satan's tactics are to destroy, to destroy, and to destroy. All right, and we'll get to this later on in the study, but why does he want to destroy us, seeking, you know, roaring, prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour? Why does he want to destroy us? Because the easier, the more that he destroys us, the more he potentially prolongs the second coming of Christ, the more he destroys us, the more that means you know, we're not going to be effective witnesses and evangelists to the lost, which means there are going to be more people who are going to burn. He wants to hurt the heart of God. Okay? That, that was the whole point with him and Adam. And Eve. He wants to hurt God's heart. He knows because of the cross, and we'll get to that eventually, that it's done. It's, the seed came and won. Now it's just buying time before they're cast into the lake of fire. Well, here's the deal. When you know you've lost, well, if you've got a twisted mind, it's going to, you're going to have the mindset of, I'm going to take as many people down with me. If he can destroy your testimony, destroy your witness, destroy your mentality, destroy your, your countenance, destroy your, uh, your desire to be victorious, guess what? You may not burn if you're saved, but dang sure if he can't keep you from uh, leading other people out of the fire. His tactics are to destroy your tactics must be to recognize when he's destroying things in your life. Let, you know, students, listen to older Christians who are mature in their walk with the Lord when they say, your decision now is going to destroy your life later. Listen to them because they probably see something you're too short-sighted to see. Listen. You know, I'll use this example just because it seems to be one of the most commonly talked about things, especially in my CLC classes. The students, that's, that's alcohol. Oh, it's not a big deal. It's not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, my, my dad died 
um, because he drank alcohol and was on heart medication. Yeah. It's not really cool when a second grader finds their dad dead in the living room floor because of alcohol. Or it's not really cool when an elementary school kids, you know, watch, you know, their their parents beat each other. They didn't mean to do that when they got drunk, it just happened. Or, you know, the person that drinks and drives and kills people, you know, all this other like they never they were just started out having fun. Statistically speaking, their lives get destroyed in one way that was financially, emotionally, marital status, and then they destroy their kids' lives when they get drunk and whatever, and they end up getting a divorce and all that kind of stuff. So, destroy. He's an opportunist. The enemy's looking for that moment of weakness where he can go, I think that's... He's limited in number. He's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere. There's only certain amounts of them. He's got to use his resources wisely. He's going to look for that moment of weakness, that moment that he can destroy. Again, if he can't try to defile all the men, well, there's too many of them potentially. Well, let's go to the source. Let's take their women and destroy. It'll be a more efficient process here. And it seemed to get the attention of God. So the question here really is, are we aware of the schemes that he might use in and around our lives to defile us? Defile us in such a way as to disqualify us from the intentions that God has for us and prepare for us. Ephesians 2.10 says that God prepared us for good works. Before the foundation, before there was a heaven and an earth, he knew the intentions that he was going to create you for and to accomplish. And the enemy's goal is to figure out how he can keep you from fulfilling those intentions so that you're not effective to delay his eternal judgment and to potentially get more people to burn with him. That's his goal. Can you recognize that strategy in your own life is the real question. If you can't recognize it, you're in a very bad situation. You're, you're driving down the one-lane road and the semi-truck's got its lights turned off in the middle of the night. You're never going to see it coming. You're going to wake up one day and go, how did I get here? And the enemy's going to go, because you weren't paying attention. And when you repent, God's going to say, I love you. If, if you repent, if you have an opportunity to repent, if God is patient enough to wait for you to repent and gives you that opportunity, he's going to say, if you would have only knew what I said, I told you not to be ignorant of his schemes. He was prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he could devour. I told you these things. And you're going to go, well, I wish I would have knew. And he's going to say, how would I told you? Save yourself a lot of heartache and understand the enemy here. If we fail to know his schemes or the method of operation of our enemy, we're destined to fail in the battles with him. We have victory through Jesus over all evil and temptations. If you were saved, you have the Holy Spirit, Christ Jesus, living inside of you. You don't have to sin. But I'm going to sin. Yeah, probably. You're human, okay? You're, you're still in a, a corrupt flesh. The spirit within you is greater than he who is in the world. You sin because you choose to. Well, I just couldn't help it. That's a victim mentality. That's what the enemy wants you to do. The devil made me do it. No, he can't unless you're lost and demon-possessed, at which point you need to get saved. So <laughs> you choose because you want to. You, you, you fall to temptation because you don't fight it. I think it's Paul says in Corinthians, I think it's Corinthians where he says, you know, God has given us a way out of every temptation. No temptation is strong enough to overcome us if we have our focus on Christ Jesus. You fall into sin because you choose to. I didn't choose to, to get wrapped up into this. You chose to because you didn't choose this instead. You, you actively chose evil because you actively did not choose good. Does that make sense? You, every decision has an opportunity cost. If I choose to step left, I can't step right at the same time. If I choose to step towards sin, full activities that are going to destroy my life one day, I can't also step towards righteousness. I can't do both. And the enemy knows that, so he wants you into destruction. And I'm not going to leave it right there for the application. I want to just throw out a couple more um, thought-provoking questions here. Because I always get still wrapped up on these demons <laughs> and these children kind of thing. First Peter um, chapter 13, 2 Peter, or sorry, 1 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 2, Jude 6, Revelation 20, Luke 8, they all talk about these demons. 
Jesus, uh, it says in one of the passages that I just mentioned that uh, Jesus, at the, the, his crucifixion, uh, you know, before he conquered death and sin, you know, in that moment, that he went to those spirits who were disobedient in the days of Noah. Context clues. The demons that stepped out of our side had, you know, had all these offspring. And he went to them in the abyss, in that outer darkness, to declare victory to them. Interesting. When Jesus went to the demoniac, um, in Luke chapter 8, verse 31, the demons run, you know, the demoniac man runs up to him and says, who are you? Why have you come to torment us before the appropriate time? And Jesus is like, um, <laughs> and like, can you please cast us out to the pigs? The demons were begging Jesus not to torment them before the judgment day. Why would they be begging Jesus not to torment them before judgment day? Had that happened before? The word abyss there, where it says these spirits are, is Tartarus in the Greek. Greek mythology, that word is only used one time in the entire New Testament, as in that place, most passages I quoted. That word in Greek mythology refers to the holding place of the Titans, those super gods, those empowered creatures that were mighty and were the Titans. They were the gods before the gods. They were the ones from way back in the day. In Revelation chapter 20, it says that he holds the keys to the abyss. And during the tribulation, he's going to release the spirits that are in the abyss. That place is one that the demons are afraid of. And apparently, these uh, that stepped out of their bounds... I mean, God didn't just destroy the earth and say, All right, y'all don't do that again to the demons. He took them and threw them in a place of torture. And they're going to sit there, and they're still sitting there until today. The and Jesus actually, after the cross, he went down there and said, I told you, more or less... <laughs> I'll see you again, and it's going to be worse. Because again, the, the abyss isn't even as worse as the lake of fire that's still to come. And you can imagine when you read Revelation 20 why those spirits were so ticked off and just tried to destroy the world. I mean, they had been in a place of torment, the holding place of the Titans, according to Greek mythology, for so long. So he dealt with them. I'm not going to answer the question, though, why did Peter and Jude bring it up? So... I'm just going to leave you with that one. I'm going to pray, and then we can do some Q&A in the next couple minutes if we got it. So, Lord, um, I want to thank you for tonight. I want to thank you for this lesson. I want to thank you for your word. Um, I pray that the students in here, that they would see you in your word and that they would give you glory because you are victorious. You foreknew everything that would happen. You, you know every scheme that the enemy has. Next week as we look at the life of Job, you're, you, it's going to... We're going to see that the enemy has to actually get your approval and permission before he can do anything evil. So God, you're victorious. When the enemy has to get the permission of his enemy to even attack, that's not a very powerful enemy. So God, I pray that the students in here would recognize his schemes, that they would realize that he wants to destroy them, to defile them. Let them analyze their life Look at every aspect of their life, their relationships, their hobbies, their habits, their thought processes, their train of thinking, anything in their life that operates on a daily basis or even on occasion within them and say, is this defiling me and will it destroy me one day? And if it is, God, let them repent of it. Be patient with them. Be patient as their eyes are opened so that they could repent, be brought back to you, free from the enemy's hands if they're lost, freed from his power and, and domain if they're saved, but they're just falling in the sin and are wrapped up in it. God, show them the, how awesomely victorious you are. Uh, God, um, let them know that the seed that conquered the enemy came. God was faithful to bring him, and his name was Jesus. And that seed was faithful in his life to go to the cross, to die, to be buried, to raise again, and is faithful enough to come back and that seed lives inside of us. Therefore, we don't have to be victims of our enemy. We don't want to be victims because we want to live a life that pleases you. And we want to live a life that leads others to you. So, Lord, I thank you. And I thank you for your word. As you know, we pray. Amen. All right, we got it is 7